So, not too long ago, I was browsing around eBay and managed to find an oddly cheap phone listed up as a Samsung. So, I decided to take a bit of a gamble and ordered what is meant to be a Samsung phone for £5. This right here is the £5 Samsung Galaxy S2 from 9 years ago. That's right, a nearly decade old phone that I just spent a fiver on, and it has some pretty powerful specifications under the hood. Powered by a dual-core Xenos 4 chip developed by Samsung themselves, everyone's favourite GPU from the era with a Mali 400MP graphics chip, and 1GB of system DDR3L RAM included on board. The main area that this phone actually gets a bit impressive is the screen, which is a 4.3 inch 800x480 Super AMOLED screen, which is pretty damn impressive for a near decade old phone. Everything else is pretty standard, you got Bluetooth, some mediocre camera from around 10 years ago, a batch which you can remove, which is pretty fancy, you don't actually see that nowadays, and still, it's not a bad phone with pretty decent specifications for when it came out, and specs that definitely held up over time, but whether or not they hold up today is a different story. With the specs out of the way, the main area that the phone actually falls down is that it hasn't been updated for years. Stuck running an ancient version of Android, which works, just don't expect it to do anything you'd expect a modern smartphone to do. Applications hardly work, even some websites won't load on the included browser, and it's not like you can't update these, it's just the state of older Android means that you don't really want to download the third party ones, because trying to track down an APK that still works is sometimes a bit tedious and not that fun to do. Still, the phone does work, it's just not great as a phone by 2020 standards. Because if I spend £5 on a phone packing some pretty impressive specifications, what better thing to do than to throw the latest version of Android straight onto it and then try some really intensive benchmarks? Because that's what we want to see all phones do. And nope, that wasn't a typo. When I say I'm going to throw the latest version of Android straight onto this thing, that means it's exactly what I was going to do. See, when I pulled this thing out of my drawer after sitting there where I'd bought it and left it for a video at some point, I initially bought it just to tinker around with. I completely forgot that I bought it for a video and I was just flashing new partitions onto the phone before I turned my interest to the XDA forums and saw that someone had gone out of their way to port Android 10 via the Cyanogen mod. Which, of course, you know you have to jump through a few hoops to get it running, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. First of all, major props to the fellas over on the XDA forums who are actively looking after these old devices. I always seem to go straight to the XDA forums to actually get a ROM and the instructions of what to do. And I do tend to do my own tweaking on the side, but still, this is absolutely insane what they've managed to set up on this little 10-year-old device. Now, this video isn't even a tutorial, it's not a rough guide, it's nothing more than me trying to embark on a little project and filming as I go along, which is what a lot of these videos actually turn out being. I'll link below the XDA forums in the description, as that'll provide you the files, the instructions, and the great people who you should be thanking for actually bringing this to you. All in all though, we need to start off by replacing the stock PIT and PDA files on the phone by flashing them using the latest version of Samsung's Odin software which is what you use to flash these. With repartition enabled, because that's exactly what we're messing with, partitions, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, get on a new custom recovery, and from there actually install the operating system, or the ROM, or however you want to say it. And at this stage, people often ask me, budget builds, what is a custom recovery, and why are you always installing them on older phones? Well, the reason behind that is that the stock recovery on most phones is very basic and it only lets you really put the phone back to factory settings. A custom recovery, like Clockwork Recovery Mod, or in this case the Team Win Recovery Project, acts a bit more like a BIOS on a computer. It's where you can install an operating system, or ROM as they're more often called, and have low level control over the device, things like kernels and things that you really shouldn't be messing with if you don't actually know what they are. Anyways, from here we need to swap back to the PC from the phone and copy over the new operating system and Google Apps, which are the things that you need to get Google Play Store and things like that running, because they're on an SD card at the moment, so we put them on the SD card and stick it back in the phone. And this is where the fun starts. Fun meaning that if you mess it up, the phone isn't going to boot part. So what we've got to do first is to wipe all the cache on the phone, the data, the system, the non-emulated storage, anything that could possibly be a remnant of Android 4.4. And then comes the really fun part, we just queue up the files to install, namely the operating system and then Google, and from there we have to wait, and hope to hell that it actually installs. 
So, with both of those actually installed successfully, the first time I might say, all we need to do is restart, but we do not want to install the TeamWin Recovery Project app. All that does is let you boot straight back to the recovery from your Android desktop, but it seems to cause some issues with this ROM, and I've also noticed it causes issues with a few other ones. Generally, I don't tend to install it. But once we've already decided that we don't want that installed, we just have to let the phone boot up, and it does take a little while on first boot, as most new ROMs do, and we've got it. A nine-year-old phone with the latest and greatest operating system on, but what does this mean? Is it actually usable? Is it unusable? And does it work as a phone? We want it to. My first impressions were not fantastic. The phone was struggling as soon as I turned it on. This little Samsung did not seem to even want to get through the setup screen, I hadn't even put a SIM card or connected it to the Wi-Fi yet, and it wasn't helped by making our way to the desktop or home screen or whatever you want to call it, but after that, well about 15 minutes after that and the phone had calmed down and I'd gone to make myself a cup of tea, it seemed like things had gotten a bit more speedy which wasn't very difficult. Previously, if I tried to swipe down, I had to wait 30 seconds for a bloody menu to pop up. But anyway, maybe there was something going on in the background with the task setting up the operating system that I couldn't do anything about. So it seemed after leaving it for about 10 to 15 minutes with this ROM just sat on the table with the charger plugged in, it was ready to use. And it seemed to be running pretty decently after it all calmed down. So what exactly are we going to do with it? At this point though, I turned to the community, because I've tested my fair share of phones on this channel, and at this point people actually like phone content from this channel, which is something I'm really happy with, but I wanted to appeal to what people wanted to see most, because my use cases are my use cases, and people use their phones for different things. So when I asked the community, who compiled a list down of all the things people want to see tested, decided to go through and pick out some of the great benchmarks to stress the hardware, as well as some other good tests for general usage, as this is a phone after all, so why don't we get those phone things out of the way first? Can a phone do all the generic smartphone things we expect a generic smartphone to do in 2020? General usage was pretty fantastic. I've taken the phone around with me pretty much everywhere over the last week, and you'll have to excuse some of the rough filming in a few places because, you know, I don't bring my full DSLR with me everywhere I go, but the phone was absolutely fantastic for all the basic tasks I needed to get up to on the day to day. Things like working as a basic GPS in the car, syncing to a Bluetooth head unit, and all the other tasks that I do you know, with a vehicle are pretty fantastic, including using OBD2 programs and things like that. When I was browsing the web, it seemed to work okay, much better than it previously did with that older version of Android, which had a tendency to crash either the web browser or the phone with a lot of modern websites. Luckily though, a lot of the things people use nowadays are in the form of websites, because the app variants tend to be a bit better optimized, and with full Android 10 app support, I could install virtually all apps I needed to, and they worked absolutely fine. Although for some reason, things that required logins to Google, like emails, would struggle and take a while to load, but I think that was probably due to inbox sizes and the small amount of RAM and poor internet connectivity we had sometimes. Still, this was able to upload some files and send them on absolutely fine, and other than a few file directory errors which cropped up here or there, which can happen with custom ROMs, it's mostly down to the type of apps I was using, because I was, you know, using ones which require setting up, and even then, it was also down to my SD card, which is working perfectly fine with Android 10, and doesn't seem to have any issues storing apps or data or anything that you can have with a few custom ROMs. One huge advantage I did notice going forward, which is going to sound really, really stupid, is that we had 16 gigabytes of internal storage, and Android 10 had made this all usable, so we could swap between the SD card and internal storage depending on what we wanted to install or where we wanted to put our files, which is a lot easier compared to some of the other Samsungs we've seen on the channel, where usually they are pretty abysmal turds and don't even have enough internal storage to install most apps, so you have to mess around with routing and installing link to SD and just loads of other programs just to install applications, something you don't have to do on this phone. But a lot of you didn't come here to see if a phone can be used as a phone. Most of you came here for the much harder benchmarks. So I've compiled a nice list of all the ones people wanted to see forced onto this Galaxy S2 nearly a decade later, just so you can see it running to its full potential. So let's start with the most exciting benchmark I could get running on the phone with the highly requested X-Ash 3D, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is Half-Life running on a custom engine which has been ported to ARM. And with a little bit of time spent tweaking around with a few settings here or there, we managed to get this 9 year old phone running Half-Life with a decent resolution at a full 60fps. 
Now, we could drop some frames here or there, especially when the CPU was being hammered with a lot of entities on screen, especially some parts early on in the train ride into Black Mesa, as that did seem to be one of the weakest parts on the phone and an intensive area in the game. So provided you could deal with some of the, you know, frame drops here or there, and the semi-awkward controls which are definitely a pain in the arse on mobile, you could see yourself running Half-Life on a near-decade-old phone at a full 60fps. A slightly newer game up next with Oddworld Munch's Odyssey, which originally came out on the original Xbox. Now, with a slightly higher resolution than what we originally saw on that console, we saw a pretty solid experience. No, it wasn't 60fps, like the original Half-Life was, however it did tend to hover just above that 30fps mark, but once again, the smaller screen did cause me some issues actually trying to play the game with the controls, but still a very successful experience and one that ran really nicely as well, all the while looking absolutely fantastic. Emulation-wise is where this phone is a bit strange, as all in all, it's very much game-dependent depending on the emulator you're using, but a lot more so than the other devices I've used because there seems to be a big CPU bottleneck in a lot of the emulators. Now, I don't think many of us expect to see a £5 phone running a lot of these titles, but here you have the N64 running upscaled to 720p and then downsampled onto the Galaxy S2 screen. All in all, it looks absolutely fantastic and hardly dropped any frames whatsoever, running at a near-locked 30fps. However, this was all very game-dependent, as I just mentioned, as some games much preferred running at the stock 480p or 240p, with games like Majora's Mask just about running in 720p, however they would drop a few frames here or there, so you'd be best off dropping the resolution. PlayStation emulation was no struggle at all for the phone. Regardless of what game I tried to run, even the final year titles like Gran Turismo 2 worked perfectly fine, and I didn't really see many frame drops here or there at all. I was able to run some slight upscaling, and other titles like Metal Gear Solid, which were also very intensive, also ran absolutely fine on the phone, so once again, no issues whatsoever there. But that's hardly intensive compared to running the N64 and 720p like we just saw. Where the device did struggle a bit more was with Drastic, where high-resolution 3D games like the Zelda series experience major graphical errors when utilising dual threading to try and achieve any sort of playable frame rate. Turning this off would fix the graphical issues, but would absolutely destroy the frame rate, so those harder games to run are completely unplayable. Either way, for simpler 2D titles, they ran absolutely fine and is genuinely impressive to see because a lot of the great 2D titles on the DS are well worth playing and play perfectly fine on a Galaxy S2. Even things like the latest version of Minecraft work absolutely fine with no issues whatsoever, although once again the CPU is going to hold you back in any intensive areas, like loading in chunks, loading in the world, and things that involve loading could take their fair share of time, and would also drag down the frame rate while they were going on. All in all, I'd imagine older variants of the game would run absolutely fine, and these newer versions will run, just keep in mind you'll experience some, well, some, quite a lot of slowdown when you're loading in a lot of the chunks. OpenTTD is another PC game, this time from the 90s, which worked absolutely fine in the native resolution of the phone, and even saw me using the Z-Base texture pack, which does tend to be higher quality than the default one, and usually more intensive because of that. But we saw no performance issues whatsoever, and I was playing on a multiplayer server so I could at least control what was going on, as other than the small screen, it is a bit of a hard game to navigate, especially on mobile, and even if you have a large 10-inch tablet, you're still going to struggle to play this game, but still, there were no performance issues whatsoever, the game was fully playable, and provided your hands are absolutely tiny, you can even control it on the screen. Now, there were plenty of other titles people wanted to see running, like Knights of the Old Republic, which wouldn't even launch at all, I have no idea why, and I'm really sorry because of that, because I did try sideloading it and a few things like that, but to no avail. Uh, things like Dolphin Emulator running. Well, I sort of got it working, but you have to output the signal via the micro USB port because it won't display it natively on the screen, so I can happily show you what some of the abysmal footage I managed to capture looks like, but still, it's impressive it managed to start GameCube games, just don't expect to be running them. 3D Mark's iStorm also ran okay, 
but the main issue is that they've removed the unlimited option from the benchmarking app, so you are unable to gauge a comparison with modern smartphones because modern smartphones will max out these older tests and the unlimited one let you get an unlimited score. Either way, it let me show a comparison with each of the operating systems in place as we saw a slight increase in overall performance from the SoC when using Android 10. People were telling me Android 10 would end up performing worse than the stock OS. I don't know what they were on about, because usually it sees an improvement just because you're away from touch with. But I took the liberty of going through and testing quite a few other ROMs, and Android 10 seemed to do really well, along with virtually everything that wasn't the bloated stock ROM. You know, you're going to see an improvement if it's not touch with. Really though, everything seemed to work perfectly fine, and that's going to be the emphasis on this video because everything about this phone is just fine. Even as a media player, it was fine. I was able to watch YouTube videos and listen to music absolutely fine on it, but it definitely wasn't great, especially with the phone's limitations. I wouldn't say anything other than the emulation quality on the phone was particularly fantastic. Oh, and Half-Life was amazing to see. Battery life, I did do a few tests on the day-to-day -day usage and managed to ring out around half a day's usage on one charge, but thankfully you can just replace the battery, which probably would be the best thing to do because they're not exactly expensive. Oh, and if you try anything intensive like gaming on the phone, with the battery the phone came with it ended up lasting just an hour. So, not great and you might want to look into upgrading that. By this point, I was nearing the end of my week with the phone and had managed to come across the things that really did annoy me. One gigabyte of RAM was definitely a constraint for loading in websites. Really only browsing seemed to cause issues with this little RAM, and it could be down to memory leaks in the browser or certain websites not being optimised, and not to mention that the Wi-Fi range on these phones is downright abysmal, as the phone would often drop out where most modern phones don't even struggle to get a signal. Pair that with the occasional UI crash, and my pettiest complaint yet, which is the power button, which is probably worn from being near a decade old at this point, but still, it felt like half the time I was pushing down on the power button and the phone didn't do anything at all. All in all though, it seemed to be absolutely fine once I'd actually got used to it and it is just a bit worn and no matter what way I held the phone it seemed to make it any better. It might have been to do with me holding it behind the camera I thought at first, but that didn't seem to make any difference at all. And talking about cameras, just how good is the camera on the phone? Because a lot of people like to use their phone as a camera nowadays. So, there we have it, a £5 Samsung pushed to its limits with the latest version of Android, and genuinely I am impressed. We last took a look at the Nexus 4, which was perfectly fine to use, but that's also newer than this, and that phone still sells for four times as much, about 20 quid if you're lucky. Still, the Galaxy S2 is a perfect example of a cheap phone being littered all over eBay's auction and local sales. I've seen these things sold at boot fairs before. And before anyone says, why didn't you run it without gaps, you could have had an even better experience. I did try running it without gaps, briefly, just to see how well it did. And the issues were app compatibility was straight out the window, that's not going to work at all. And there were some odd quirks found when I wasn't using gaps, which is just one of those weird things when you try and remove Google from a phone, which is a bit sad when you think about it. Either way, still much smoother, but you're really limited in what you can do with the phone if you don't have gaps on it. So I tend to recommend using the Google apps if you are going to go down this route. From Android 10 all the way through to running the full fat Half-Life at 60fps, I am genuinely impressed at how well a high-end Samsung is holding up near a decade later. So hope you've enjoyed, you know, looking at these high-tier specs from 2011 and pushing them to their limits in 2020. It's been really fun to see how well the phone holds up, and if you want to see more like this, do let me know. Good night. There we go, uh, a look at the Samsung Galaxy S2, which is a actually nice phone to look at, which I usually don't get the chance to, I usually end up looking at the bottom of the barrel Samsung ones. Still, if you enjoyed this, you can like and subscribe for more, or dislike if you don't like it, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.